Hey guys, hello, it's me, Runs, uh, here once again for another Run Hot or Die podcast where we discuss the competitive gaming on MechWarrior Online and other mecha related games. Uh, with me this week, I have of course our representatives from the Wolf Spiders, Cutter Wolf, hello there. Hello. And Warlock. Yo, yo, yo. And of course from Steel Jaguars, I have the ever om omnipotent, omnipresent, uh, all-knowing, the magician. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Look at that, I'm just, I'm just trying to big you up a little bit for everyone, you know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about on this yet. <laughs> I like it, you know, that's good. Okay, guys, obviously, patch this week. Uh, it's our first patch for about two weeks. Uh, a lot of things dropped in. Most importantly, we've had a new mech come in, the Cataphract. Guys, give us your impressions of the new mech. Let's go. Oh, we'll start. oh go on. Off you go. <laughs> Alright, so what, what I've seen so far is that it can be very effective. I've, I've seen, especially if you get in a brawl situation, uh, River City seems to thrive on if somebody gets pushed up against a building. Uh, they rip into you with four AC5s. It's a pretty quick depth. Uh, however, it's a pretty weak mech uh, in terms of armor. It tends to die very fast, so it doesn't have longevity of the K2. So it's a good mech. Uh, it probably has a lot of use. If they fix it, boxes will become even better. It's one of the first viable brawling, ballistic brawling mechs that we've seen. I think it'll be interesting to see how they uh, change it as it goes along. Now, obviously, there's been a lot of talk about the the cataphract because it is a ballistic mech and it's got that uh, those two ballistic arm points there. Uh, what are your feelings on that? It's not a bad. Um, I, the way that I look at this mech is it's more of a support roll mech than it is a direct brawling type mech. Just basically because the center torsos of it can't not the center torsos, but the side torsos of it can't really take the, the amount of damage that the uh, the regular gauzapult can take. Um, I don't know if that was a design error on their designing of this mech or not, but it doesn't have the amount of armor it should have in the side torsos being a 70 ton mech. So it does make it weak because a lot of people. Um, really feel that they need to run an XL motor in this mech, which really cuts down the survivability. Um, the configs that I use, I use all standard motors in mine, so it has a better survivability chance, and if you're just using the twin gauze, and if you're using the 4X, using twin gauze, and a large laser as your backup, it's very effective at punching big holes in mechs from distances, and to me at least, it's a lot more accurate in its aim than the gauzapult is. And with, with the ability, ability to be able to swing your arms left or right, up or down, it has an ability over the the uh, gauze pole to, to be able to drop and do fire from different angles where the gauze pole always having to face forward to you and can't shoot down slopes or shoot up slopes where this mech has no problem doing that. So in, in that respect, it's a lot better mech, but in, in the bro when it gets up close and brawling and stuff, because of those very weak side torsos and stuff, it makes it a very easy target to kill. Um, that's, you know, there's give and take as far as the gospel's concerned because you have that large head hitbox. And once it gets in close brawling and it's got to face that box to you to shoot, where this mech doesn't have that up. That disadvantage, especially if it's staying out at range, it can always torso twist away from a gazapult, engaging it, and be able to still fire its weapons at at that gazapult and not expose those weak torsos. So it's got some advantages, obviously, over the gazapult, but you know it's, it's going to be one of those mechs that hasn't been out long enough for us to actually fully examine all the best benefits for it. It's it's great for AC brawling, but then again, like I said, if you're using XL motors. 
Uh, all you can do is just concentrate on the left or right torso, and you can easily kill this mech with not a whole lot of effort. I mean, Warlock, what do you think about it? Uh, is it a replacement for the Gauze of Pulp? Um, for one, 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 and one only build. Basically, as a, a gas mount, yes, it, you, I, I think it makes it easier in some ways because you don't have the concerns that you have with the gas pulp because you can get plenty of ammunition in, into the Akata. But to be honest, um, my big issue with it is, is it just dies awfully fast. Um, and personally, uh, I've got two different variants, but I kind of tried really, really hard to like it, but I really don't. And, and in almost every circumstance, even with the issues of getting enough ammunition onto the gas pole, I would probably much rather use the gas pole. And it, it's, it literally it just doesn't feel like it reacts quickly enough. Um, and I just prefer the gas pole in almost every single uh, situation. I mean, Cutter mentioned there, obviously, the, the arm mounts are a particular advantage to some of the competitive play because of the, the movement of the arms, the freedom of movement around. However, a lot of people find that using or aiming with the torso, torso is a lot easier. You know, is that going to be, especially if you're playing that sniper role, a lot easier uh, with the Gorsa Pult long-range sniper fire? What do you reckon? So that's the part that that got me kind of at at a miss here because it is faster to arm aim than it is to torso aim your mech because your arms track faster than your torso. So if you're at a long range snipe fest between a gospel and the cataphract, the cataphract's going to win that engagement. It's because it can aim and hit that gospel a heck of a lot faster. Plus the fact that if the cataphract is sitting in the open, let's say, for exist for purposes of this conversation, and the Gaza pole is on the other side of the hill. It's got to come up and clear that hill, and it's going to face its most weakest part of the mech towards you to engage with, which is that head hitbox at CT. So, right there, it's giving away its weakness to the the cataphract, where the cataphract can sit there and actually be torso twisted away with using its arm aiming ability to sit there and hit that mech as he clears the hill because he's got to come up and clear enough to be able to aim those go the, 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 its twin gazes down upon that other mech where the, if the, the gospel pilot is out there waiting for him, he doesn't have that disadvantage. He can instantly aim those arms towards him while that guy's trying to line up that shot. He can line up his shot faster. So in, in that instance, he's going to. That's going to be the better mech to have. Is going to be that cataphract out there, where the cataphract is at a disadvantage. Is where they're both utilizing cover, because that cataphract's got to come all the way up and clear those low slung arms. Otherwise, he's putting shots directly into the hillside. So that's that's where your disadvantages and stuff come up with. Well, I understand what Carter actually says. I have to say I, I do disagree with him slightly because. Although the arm uh, mounts technically mean that you do get to bring your weapons to bear on target quicker, what actually happens is the weapon convergence doesn't actually converge as quickly as, as the arm does. So for a lot of pilots, what they're going to do is see the, the crosshairs where they want it to be, uh, pull the trigger, and be surprised when the two shots don't actually hit where they, they're going to. So what you're going to happen, have happen is you're going to have, hopefully if both shots hit, Maybe one hit the CT and the other one hit maybe a side tool or so. Where with the uh, gas pole, you're almost guaranteed to hit the same location with both weapons because or both shots because you don't have the issues with weapon convergence. Um, and I just think that at the moment, the, the gas pole just seems to survive longer than, than, than the cataphract does. And survivability in drop is going to be a big issue now. At the moment, we've been doing chassis versus chassis in, in competitive drops. But hopefully, we're going to get to a point when we're going on tonnage. And to be honest, I don't think the cataphract is worth that extra five tons. And given the choice between the two mechs, if we're using a tonnage based system, I will go with the, with the, with the um, gas pole every single time. I mean, it does seem to be quite a big disadvantage having those weak side torsos on the cataphract. You know, when you compare it against the Gorsa Pult, where the side torso is never really a big issue, you can 
quite happily mount uh, an XL engine on there. It's not too much of a problem. Yes, it has a big centre torso, particularly a, a, a vulnerable cockpit area. But, you know, for a lot of guys, especially for a lot of new, newer players, not having those weak side torso seems like an advantage. So too with the, the torso aiming. I mean, The Magician, what's your thoughts on that? I, I haven't played with it enough. I mean, I really haven't even played the Catfrax at all yet, so I can't really judge exactly how how it's going to compare. No, the ones I've faced have been Gauss. I had no problem taking out my Gauss bolt for whatever reason. I don't know. I think it might be the convergence issue, but I also think it's because if I'm hill popping against them, for example, in Boris Colony, I don't have to expose myself very much, whereas they have to come all the way over. So I've noticed when I fought them with my Atlas that I can easily kill or easily, you know, it's fairly damaged a cataract before it's even uh, over that, say, like the hill on, on uh, Frozen City. So, it, it, I, I think there's some problems there. What I'm really curious about, and I haven't seen many people use it yet, but is using the jump sniping one. I know people, you know, smart teammates have uh, experimented with it. People aren't really necessarily liking it that much, but I'm thinking maybe long term, it might be more viable as a jump sniping mag, uh, either with the Twin Gauss or Gauss PPC laser or something like that. I've, I've tried, tried doing it with the gas, gas and to be honest, honest the weapon convergence is a bit of an issue with it. And Unless you're doing a straight on shot, um, I can't consistently put my shots where they need to go. So, um, like I said, at the moment, I'm not a massive fan of it. I haven't tried it with lasers, I haven't tried it with BBCs, but I think the issue is, is that you're still going to have convergence issues even with the laser weapons. I mean, obviously the convergence is to an extent designed to help stop some of the, the activity we used to see during MW4, like the jump sniping and things like that. You know, so it does make sense that we're going to see some conversion issues pop up. I mean, for my money, I haven't played it a great deal, but as, as has been mentioned, the, the low-slung arms seem to be a bit of an issue when you're trying to get your aim, aim shot in. You know, it's very difficult when you're manoeuvring, you're trying to pop up over that hill, it's all too easy to get those those shots into the side of the hill, you know, and then you combine that with some of the, the weaknesses, such as the, the weak side torso and whatever else, it doesn't seem like it's the the mech that people were expecting. A lot of people were looking forward to the, the cataphract and, and having those arm-mounted gauze rifles. Do you think it's been a bit of a letdown as a mech? No, I, I think, think that, that People haven't really found that mech's niche. Um, it's probably going to become a niche mech for the AC-5 or the UAC-5 as it is. Or even if you know, once they start introducing more ballistics into the game, it may fall into one of those other type of categories. But it's like I was saying, from what I've been using it for is staying out at long range and using it as a long range support style type mech. And it's been very effective for me at, at doing just that that type of a, a role, but anytime you've got in close where there's other mechs to support, it, like I said, with those weak side torsos, if you're using XL engines, it goes down pretty fast. So that's where I, I figure it's going to end up as going to be more of a support mech than an in close brawling type mech. So guys, sorry, carry on, Warlock. I, was just saying, I can't say I'm disappointed with it. I just, I just think that it's going to end up being a, a mech that doesn't excel at anything. I think it can do lots of different roles in a reasonable manner. But um, when I look at it, I always think, well, you know what? If I want to run a laser boat, um, basically I'm going to drop down to a hunchback and save myself 20 tons. If I'm going to go with a, um, a gas board, it's going to be the K2. Um, I, just, I just don't see a dedicated role for it. And I think it's going to end up, once the novelty of it's worn off, it's just being relegated to kind of like a novelty bag that, that's used because somebody feels like a change rather than there being a genuine go-to mech. And really, that was going to be the question I was going to ask next. Are we going to see it within your competitive team lineups? The Magician, are we going to see this on SJR's NA division? I, I feel like it needs hitbox changes before it is. I, I wouldn't take it right now because I think it just dies too easily. Uh, you can hit the CT from way too many angles and it, it almost seems bugged because honestly it's like I get rid of the outside armor and the internals just seem to melt off instantly. I don't 
I don't know if it's bugged, but that's what it feels like when I actually fight it. It just doesn't it doesn't last like even like a K2 does. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if it'll really ever find its place. Uh, it's perhaps perhaps it's the AC if it, with hitbox changes and with the AC set up on there, it might find use as like a brawling mech if we ever get a true uh, city map, something like that. Cutter, what about you? Are you planning it over with you guys? Uh, so it's going to be pilot dependent. The, the mech as it is currently right now, if we were in competitive drops today, it, if we got to choose those maps, if I had a long range wide open map, that would be the mech that I would bring on. If, if I had it and I was you know, limited to tonnage or if that was the only type of mechs we had in our supply, that would be the time that I would bring out this mech would be in that style of map play because I know that players who have played it know how to utilize the, the cover and terrain and stuff for this particular mech and it's very pilot dependent on this mech because you have to know and keep in mind where your arm level is at at all times of this mech and know how to run it otherwise you're just putting yourself at a disadvantage running this mech against other ones like gospels and stuff like that it, they're, they're going to get shredded if they do not understand how to operate this mech it just it's one of those kind of mechs that it's very pilot um, dependent you gotta have a good pilot in this mech's not going to excel I mean, but that's always a question about the competitive play, isn't it? You know, how much do you let pilots have free reign in their choice of mech? And, you know, a, a lot of pilots say that they can do better with their custom Atlas or their custom uh, Centurion or whatever else, you know. And do they necessarily fit into that competitive drop role, you know, where a lot of the time the, the DC needs to know what mechs you're, you're using? what kind of uh, abilities they've got and it can't just be reliant on that one individual's pilot skill. What's yeah. your opinion? Well basically, basically I tend to do a lot of the uh, pilot and mech uh, allocation for drops for Alpha Company and I will find out what pilots I've got available and what their general taste in mechs is and I do kind of allow them to choose what kind of mech they want to drop in as long as in the chassis class that I'm assigning them to. However, I do say that it needs to be a competitive build because some people like to run some really strange configurations that, although they may do great in individual drops, they're not consistent and I want consistency from my pilots. So something like a cataphract right now, um, I'd say no to. I'd say, you know what, if you want to, if you want to go with a heavy, um, you can do everything that you want to do with another heavy mech. If you want to run AC2s, you've got a Dragon. If you want to run Gas, there's the K2. I would not let my guys use the Cataphract at the moment, unless they came up with some really strange reasoning, and at which point I then go, well, okay, we'll give it a go and see what happens. But it's highly unlikely. Magician, what's your views? Where's SJR stand on this? Well, I, I mean, I said previously I, I don't really see it until things are changed. However, I, when I talk to the players who have used the mech so far, they enjoy the mech, they like, you know, they have fun playing with it, but I ask them, is there something that you would want us to take on a competitive match? And I think everyone has said no. They haven't really felt that it's better in its, uh, weight, in its weight class than any other mech, or than the K2, rather. And one of the other nice things I want to talk about with the Cataphract is just how smoothly it seems to have been implemented with the last patch. Um, and, and this is obviously a, a quite a positive sign for, for PGI. The, the model quality is pretty good. The animation quality, to my mind, is very good. It looks, it feels right for the cataphract. And, you know, this is, is quite a positive thing. We've had a couple of missteps with previous patched in uh, mechs. The Commando particularly springs to mind when that first came in and, and his animations with movement. Uh, guys, what do you think? Is this a positive sign? Is PGI taking more time and care with its mechs? Is this why we're seeing slight delays with the, the patches? Could be. Um, it's really going to depend on how their art staff works with their coding staff. Um, this could just be one of those ones that they just happen to get right by luck, which I hope isn't the truth, but 
you know, um, seeing what's been happening in the past. Um, take, uh, for example, the cicada. The leg movement on that mech just isn't right. There's, there's something wrong with that. Um, they still haven't got the animation down good for um, the Centurion. When the Centurion's running at high speed, he looks more like he's ice skating or rollerblading than he is actually moving on the ground. His legs just don't move to the speed of the mech. So the, you know, they, they've got some other issues going on in there, obviously. But uh, they seem to have gotten this one right for whatever reason. I don't know. But I'm hoping that it's a trend that's going to continue. Warlock, how are you feeling about it? You think it's looking good? Yeah, yeah actually, for a change, I think they have done a really good job with, with the whole mech, and it seems to have been uh, slotted in and fitted in really, really well. Um, which I'm not going to lie about. I was slightly surprised because I was quite cynical before it arrived. Uh, but yeah, generally, I'm, I'm quite hopeful if they do this good a job with um, Cataphract, I'm hopeful that when the Stalker comes out, they'll do the same with that. I mean, Magician, should we, should we expect longer patches for this kind of quality of mech animation and models? You know, should we, rather than expecting weekly patches, if we can expect better quality for a two-week patch or even a monthly patch, is that the way PGI should go? Um, okay, so I'm going to be the cynical one again, because <laughs> they might have had the cataphragm mostly right, except they had a hot fix on the server side of the head. The HUD damage was, was outrageous on it, and some server side fix uh, improved that. However, for my purposes, this has been one of the worst patches for stability. I have more HUD issues than I've ever had and more crashes than I've had before. The yellow HUD or the no HUD bug that's coming out right now, just it completely ruins enjoyment when one of your players gets that, because now you're really running a group of three or a group, sometimes a group of two at that point. Um, Otherwise, yeah, I mean, the patch has been pretty good. I mean, the shadows work now on your own mech, so that's nice. You actually see the shadow of your mech moving. And uh, the AC5s, you know, they had to fix that. I don't know if they, they did a change to the AC5 or what they did, but then they had to hot fix that. However, now, when you shoot the LJC5, it has a chance on jamming, even on the first shot, not just if you hold down to do the, the, um, the double shot. So that's some bug that they added when they already hot fixed. So I'm still a little frustrated. I don't feel like they have a real QA process yet. I don't feel they have adequate testers or people who are being honest with them and tell them that this thing is broken, they need to fix it. Uh, I have to say I agree with a lot of what Magician was saying there. And I think one of the biggest letdowns are on the patch was them not mentioning beforehand that 8 versus 8 was coming back in. I mean, they led us to believe it was going to be two weeks before this was going to be implemented. And they're still saying they have it just about sorted and it's just about ready. And the phase three is just about ready and it's just about to come in as well. But you know what? Um, most of their revenue stream is coming in through people who are hardcore players, who play in teams, who want the 8 versus 8 game. And to be honest, I'm surprised that the... That the uh, bitching and complaining about the lack of 8 versus 8 this patch uh, was actually quite restrained this time. Um, but you know what, I, I think that's got to be the major point of this patch, was that if, if it wasn't ready, they should have said beforehand, look, we've got it kind of close, but it isn't ready to be released yet, we need another week or two weeks to get it sorted so we can actually use it. And if they've done that, the community as a whole would go, well, okay, we're going to cry and complain a little bit, little bit about it, but we'll accept it because you've said and you've told us what's going on. Right now, one of the biggest issues in um, Wolf Spiders, and I, I would imagine something that's the same for a lot of units, are players who are getting to the point where they're getting frustrated with doing four versus four drops. They, they don't necessarily like the way the pugs play, you can, because you can take a pug to water, but you can't make it drink. Um, and, and it's just so bloody frustrating. I mean, I've sat there, and I've tried really, really hard on several occasions to help pugs understand what's going on in the game. And if they don't want to be helped, they don't want to be helped. And I'm not going to force them to do anything. I couldn't even if I wanted to. But you know what, I'm at that point where I really 
really don't want to drop the pugs anymore. I would quite happily shoot the pugs on my team and destroy them, so me and the other four people, three people on my team can have a decent game against the opposition. Um, but that would get me banned and give wolf spiders a bad reputation, so I'm being a nice wolf spider and letting them kill themselves instead. Letting them farm their XP, letting them just do all the ridiculous things that pugs do. So, um, I'm get your arse in gear and get the bloody 8 versus 8 back in. Thank you. <laughs> Ran <laughs> over at least, at least slash. We told us December fourth, so at least we have a date now for that. Yeah, yeah I'll believe that when I see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'd, 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 I'd like to weigh in on this also. It's it's, it's one, one of these things, things where transparency, transparency is everything, everything. And, and they, they haven't, haven't been very transparent, transparent on exactly, exactly what they're doing when they're, they're doing, doing it, and when, when they, they just drop things on us like this and and expect the whole community just to go, okay, no problem, give them a pass. It, it seems that we are having to do this um, patch after patch after patch. I, I, I think they probably set themselves up a little bit too ambitious of a, of a patch schedule. Um, two weeks per patch would have probably been much better than trying to patch something every week. Your, your every week patch, or even every two week patch, should be a patch that's correcting issues that we already know are in game. Um, I know since I joined, you know, way back in the the closed beta, that there are still issues from that first patch I downloaded that are still active today that have not been addressed or fixed. It, it's it's one of these things where it it looks like they're being guided or pushed uh, monetarily by their sponsors trying to get this game to turn a profit before they can do anything else. So they're trying to cram as much content into the game as they possibly can to try and attract and keep anybody who's interested in the game. But by also doing this, they're burying these other bugs that are already present in the game and adding more into the game. So every patch is like we get one baby step forward and two or three large steps backwards because the more stuff that they're adding and not fixing the other stuff previously to it is breaking new stuff and then even breaking the stuff that was broke before even worse. So either they have to slow down or get a much larger coding team and start going back to looking at those issues that have been long standing and start correcting those issues and working their way forward and then adding content maybe once a month and not worry so much about adding content. Right now I think the majority of all of us and anybody playing this game would much rather have a smooth working non-crashing game instead of having all kinds of content to look at and go wow this is really pretty and Cryo Engine is a very pretty engine. I'll give that to them. There, there's no doubt about it, but you are killing that prettiness by having a non-functional game. And we're at that point now where there's too many things that are broken that are actually driving new players away from this game instead of adding new players to this game. It's just one of those things. If you get on and you know how, how frustrated that we are and everybody on our team and all of our friends are about bugs, you can imagine if you just downloaded this game and drop it to the game and your screen goes yellow or you lose your HUD, or you just suddenly find yourself back at your desktop and wonder what happened. You start figuring, trying to figure out, is it my computer? Is there a problem with my internet connection? You start scrambling and going through all kinds of... And this is from a brand new player. How is a brand new player supposed to come back with a positive playing experience with this kind of issues going on? You can't get that. So I, I, I think they're actually hurting themselves more than they're helping themselves. And this all rotates right back around to the announcement of, hey, we're thinking about bringing in third-person view because people can't figure out how to drive their mechs. That's not how you fix, I can't drive my mech. You fix that by creating actual tutorials that show you how to drive your mech and how these control functions work. I just can't understand why PGI thinks they have to reinvent the wheel when there's been several other Mech Warrior titles out there, decades old now, that solved all these issues already. And just, it doesn't make sense. That's what we're saying there. I mean, they're saying, saying, that. That. I mean, they're they're saying about all these complaints about people making, about not being able to drive the Mech, can't control the Mech, and how it's affecting their enjoyment of the game. 
Yeah, you know, I honestly can't remember seeing more than about two posts on the forums anywhere about people having problems driving a Mac. I mean, I can remember people saying that they, they, it takes a bit of getting used to, but I don't remember anybody crying and saying it's a broken feature of the game and they want it nerfed or made simple. So, you know, I just think it's a bullshit reason by uh, PGI for them to shoot more in something that they want to shoot more in. Because it, it's, an e it's an easy thing for them to say, you know what, um, how do we get this feature into a game? I know. We'll say that we keep getting emailed about it, saying that we people need it to get into the game. And it's not like, we can't prove one way or the other that what they're saying is true or not. But at the end of the day, it's why try and fix something like Cuts were saying is isn't broken. Let's leave the game as it is, but put a, a simple tutorial in there. We, we talked, talked about this last time. Mac Warrior 4 had a simple tutorial that took about 15 minutes to play through, and it showed you how to control your, your Mac, how to shoot your Mac, how to torso twist, how to actually do all the basic things to control your Mac. Yes, I realize it's a coding issue, and that they need to divert resources away to do it, but get it done and just put it in there. I mean, it doesn't. it's not going to kill anything. It's not going to um, kill your cycle. It, it maybe will take you a month to two months, if, even if you have to code it from scratch. But do that. Don't play features that we don't need and we don't want and that are potentially are going to be issues for hackers to play with. Yeah, that's, and that's the one last thing that I wanted to add about this particular line is my biggest fear, and it's because I've got you know, first-hand experience with it, I'm sure you guys do too, in every first person sim that I have ever played with, every time that they have come up with the idea of adding third person view to it and then restricting it to it being an option or to where you have to join a server that's strictly forced first person, every time that has happened, because once that coding has got in there, hackers have gone in there and were able to turn that feature on in any circumstance to where you can have it on at all times. Because once it's in there present and it's a selectable menu, it makes it very easy for a hacker to go in there and change coding in order for it to be available anytime. And that's my biggest fear is once they add that feature in there, you can guarantee it will be hacked. It's just one of those things. You will be in a forced first person server, if that's how they're going to set it up, and there will be people in there playing in third person mode because it gives you that tactical advantage. Everybody knows that. It's just one of those facts of life that that's what's going to happen. But, and I understand from the monetary point of view where they're trying to get people to come in and from a World of Tanks point of view where they, they want to have that you know, third person view so you drive to wherever you want to go to and then you go into first person mode to do your actual fighting and stuff from and, and zoom and all that kind of stuff which works um, well for World of Tanks but it doesn't work for this game that's set up to work as a sim. It, it really takes away from the player immersion and I just can't under I can understand if that's where they want to go because it's a monetary thing, but they're not going to be able to lock it down. It's just going to be one of those things that we as their community players are going to have to deal with and, and realize that you're going to see the hack come out that's going to make it available in force first person. I mean, Magician, we, we discuss this an awful lot with the midweek podcast the other week, the whole third person thing. Do you think PGI is being pushed on a on a monetary basis? Uh, and we are going to get on to to the whole pricing structure of PGI a little bit later on. Um, uh, I imagine we're going to end up talking at length about that. Um, but do you think that there there is this drive there, um, either from IGP or whoever else their sponsors are, to put in these features, put in content at the expense of short-term patch fixes which should have been done a long time ago um I, I, you know i don't know i don't know if they're doing it because igp is asking them to because igp thinks they'll make more money having that feature or not i i just don't think they've come out and said a good reason why to add it so they have, i don't think they convinced the community that this is something that needs to be done uh, as for money wise, I found it interesting that I think it was Russ, or I can't remember, I'm not sure if it was Russ or Brian, said this game has surpassed $10 million in development. And I look at this game, 
And I got, I got a really question where that $10 million has gone to. Maybe you know, part of it's licensing, server, hardware costs, but $10 million, and we have four maps. I mean, it just doesn't seem very realistic to me that they've, they've spent that much money and they've gotten this little out of it. It's in the Cayman Islands somewhere. Just saying. <laughs> in the RGB's back pocket. <laughs> HSBC is currently uh, currently holding on to it. <laughs> um, allegedly, my lawyers have instructed me to say. Um, yeah, I mean it's a, a big thing, and we one of the things we we were going to discuss anyway is PGI has always had a fairly optimistic timeline for getting NWO out in general. Uh, and I think, Cutter, one of the things that you, you wanted to mention was uh, indeed about the whole uh, timeline issue at the moment. I think by your reckoning, you said the, the Inner Sphere should have met the clan's August time, you know, and we're still only in open beta. We should have been in release, I think, for about three months now, according to uh, PGI's timeline. You know, so... Where are we going with that? Yeah, yeah that's... Uh, that was when we talked about this earlier. Is I, 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 I think that they definitely have to do a timeline reset somewhere. Because, the, you know, according to the, the whole history of the Intersphere, where we're at right now, in August, this past August, is when the Kelhounds had their first encounter with the class. So that already took place. By March of this coming year, the clans were in full invasion mode. I can't see us getting from where we're at right now in four months to clan invasion mode. We haven't even added half of the, the upcoming inner sphere mechs that we're supposed to, and now we're supposed to be adding in all these clan mechs on top of that, and all the balance issues that all those new weapons and weapon types are going to bring into this arena at this stage of the game. I just can't see it happening. Now, if we were shooting for March of 2014, yeah, that's when we could probably handle doing clan invasion because I would hope by then we would have a full year to be able to track down and clear all these bugs, have joystick configuration up and running, have all the features implemented and running to where they're supposed to, and have all we'd be doing by that point then would just be adding mechs and fine-tuning any balancing issues between mechs and hard points. Which, which is actually an open beta where we should be at right now, which we're not. So we're a long ways away from getting to that point, um, especially when ever they're going to start development. I, I'm hoping that they're probably doing development on the side right now for the meta game. Um, we're a long ways off for any kind of real competitive gaming in, in this whole arena of where Mech Warrior sits at right now. It's just. It's, it's not, not there yet. There's just too many features and too many bugs. They either only work part of the time or don't work at all or are so badly broken that it's causing all kinds of balance issues. And all that has to be addressed and worked out first. And that's what I was talking about. I think they're too ambitious with their patching schedule. They need to slow down, back up, forget about content, and get the game stable. Get all these annoying little crash bug issues taken care of so that that new player coming into the game has the best experience possible so we can build and enlarge the community. Otherwise, we're just killing ourselves. Yeah, I think that's, you know, it's... It's definitely an issue that needs to be looked at by PGI and how how they're going about with this this sort of thing. I mean, Warlock, what's your view on it? Well, well, to be honest, honest when I take a look at their um, suggested time line, I think they must have spoken crap when they came out of it. <laughs> um, because, because we look, look at where we are, and uh, uh, what I was saying, the uh, invasion is in full force by the, the second quarter of next year. year. Um, they, they can't back us the next we've got now, so God knows what's going to happen when you start throwing the plan take in on top of that. Um, I, I, I genuinely think, think they need to sit down and evaluate where they, they want this product to be and where, and where they can realistically, and that's the key word there, realistically expect this product to be in March next year. And if they think they can get it there, 
by all means, leave things, things as, as they are. are. But, but if, if, if you realistically don't think, think you can get this product to where it needs to be for the plan invasion, you deal with it now, you deal with it in the immediate future, and you say, OK, we've taken a look at how things are going, we've decided that we can't meet the set goals that we had, and rather than leave it to the last minute and annoy everybody by then saying that, yes, the calculation is going to happen, but we've decided we can't do it right now, so we're going to put it off for a month, and then six months later they actually do it. They're far better off saying, you know what, what we're actually going to do is set the timeline back by a year. That will give us another year to actually get everything balanced, it gives us another year to fix the little bugs in the game that are causing the yellow screens, that are causing the crashes to crash the desktop. My client personally is now so unstable that I can't host a group anymore because I crash so often. And it gives them the chance to fix that kind of thing so that in um, 16 months' time or 17 months' time, we can then have a plan invasion where the majority of things are going to be working where we're going to have a decent amount of maps, where we're going to have all the industry and maps that we're supposed to have, where we can have half a dozen plan maps that are going to be where we want them to be. So I think it comes down onto PGI and um, IG to come up with a realistic idea of what they can think they can achieve. And I think that that's where they need to sit down and decide, can they actually do this stuff? And if they can't be be honest and they just tell us and I think by doing, doing that they will get a far better reaction now than, than they will in five months time when they suddenly turn around and say actually no we can't do it. Magician what do you think? I mean is a, a timeline reset needed or is it something of nothing? Uh, well, well first, first uh, uh, here there's an uh, echo that's coming, coming through. through. I don't know <laughs> if it's coming through one of your speakers onto your mic or something. So but I want to check that. Get it squared. Yeah, yeah, I think Reds might be coming through yours. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's transmitting over this and TS, TS at the same time, I believe, is what the issue might be. Is that what it is? Yeah. yeah. Probably, Probably just mute your, your mic on TS, TS and I, I bet you you'll probably won't have that problem anymore. As for uh, presenting the timeline, I'm not sure if it's, if it's needed or not, because I don't know what their... Uh, mysterious plans are for this. I don't know if they have a bunch of mechs that are already in development, and that might be why we're seeing a month in between each mech coming out. Yeah, or, okay, someone's transmitting. <laughs> nope, hang on. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I think it's possible they have a bunch of clan mechs already in development, and that's why we haven't seen it. Or at least they're mostly ready. I hope so. Because if they're going to do the clan invasion right, and we're actually going to see Clan Max, and, and it's not just going to be news for the first six months of it. And I, I think they need, they might need to do a reset. It'll be a little weird because they've been doing all these timeline posts coming out from uh, uh, Billis, Bills, and I. So I don't know if that's the direction that they would be willing to take is to do a reset because that kind of almost has a mission of defeat, like they a mission of failure in a way. However, for the enjoyment of the players, I think players would really like to play through a clan invasion when the game is working properly. And, you know, they haven't really announced yet when the community warfare aspect's even coming. So they've, they've given us a timeline now up through, I think it's like end of, like early January or so, and they don't have that as part of it. Now, well, initially I they said three months after open beta was when we should see it. However, initially they thought open beta would come out in August, in my opinion. If you have a team of people developing this, this means that this should be just about done. I mean, community warfare should be just about ready. However, if they had to switch their few resources over to fix things, to get things going for open beta, and this can be three months after open beta was, that means we're, we still should be, what, in February? We're looking at February, maybe, for when we should have a start to community warfare. But, yeah, I don't know. I just, I, you know, for me personally, I just want. I want private lobbies more than I want community warfare, but for uh, the survival of the game, I think community warfare is going to be awesome. So I, I, I hope they get that out and hope they get it working right. And I just hope they have well, the plan. I'm, I hope it's on their plans to do it right. I'm just going to point out that they used to have a post on their uh, developers' forums saying when each aspect was due. 
um, and community warfare used to be listed on there as December or January. It's now not listed at all. I mean, that's probably better, though, to an extent, because at least they're not sticking to an old time. You know, I know they've removed the the listing of community warfare, but better that they remove it and that they're being realistic about it to an extent, rather than saying, oh, yeah, yeah, it will be ready for December, and then December rolls around, and once again, you know, as is typical, we, we don't see the content that's promised. Yeah, I don't disagree with you, but I do think that a little post um, saying, actually, we've decided that we can't um, do this when we said we were going to, so we've decided to postpone it. Actually, just giving that little bit of information does so much for making the community actually feel genuinely part of what's going on, rather than just trying to take it off and bury it, bury it and hope everybody's forgotten about it. That's that whole transparency thing we were talking about coming into play again. Goddamn transparency. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, a couple of other things that we've had on this week. Um, obviously, we've had the Piranha Hunt. Uh, that was held this week. Now, again, we, we're talking about PGI getting involved with their, their customer base, their player base. And this seems to have been quite a neat little way for, for PGI to to interact with a lot of their, their customers base. They ordered a little, uh, I think it was an in-cockpit item if you managed to hunt one of the, the PGI staff members and get a kill. Um, you know, there was a list of winners put up on, on the forums about it. Again, you, you know, is this something that is a bit of a cheap trick by PGI to try and curry favour with certain players, get people on and playing? all at once or do you think you know this is the sign of a company that's that genuinely wants to engage with its fan base this is an excuse to uh show us that they're going to be charging us for in-game banners in our cockpits because <laughs> that's what the winners got they got a banner so now i'm like oh great so now i'm gonna be spending like five bucks on a banner in my cockpit um i I don't know. It was kind of fun. I was hoping to see a dev so I could get a chance to take a shot at them. But I was also privately praying that while they were playing, they were going to get the yellow HUD. So they would get embarrassed. However, Rust did get DC'd, so at least there was a little bit of that. It's like, you know, if you're going to do something so public, it's kind of funny when there's a, a bug pops up. Or as when Bill Gates, you know, he's doing a Windows presentation on a blue screen. to just It makes you feel a little good that, you know, in a public setting, it's like, okay, now there's an issue. So now they really got to be, they got to take care of these problems if they're going to do more public events. But I think it was neat. I think people had fun with it. One of our, one of my teammates, he was doing really quick drops, just trying to play over and over to try to play against the devs. And I think people were trying to sync drop against the devs uh, and stuff. But I think they should have had more devs playing than just one playing at a time, because I think eight people got the kills over two hours. So I think they should have more devs playing and then have it be a bigger event. Okay. Well, I'm going to add my little bit to that. Is, I, uh, yeah, I actually do think it was a good little bit of uh, public relations for them. I think it was a nice thing for them to do. Um, but I think they need to realise is that their player base is a lot bigger than just the US. And to do it at, at such a time meant that they were actually excluding at least 50% of their player base. So I think if they're going to do it, they need to actually do it. So they do one that kind of what works for prime time US drops but then you do maybe one that works for the rest of the world as well, just so that the people who aren't up at like 3 a.m. get a chance to take part too. Because there were very few members of Alpha Company, which is the EU-based part of Wolf Spiders, who were actually able to do that. Most of us had work the following day, and um, I'm sorry, as much as I'd love to take part in something like that, um, actually still having a job so I can buy uh, MCs later, is a slightly higher priority than winning some little banner. I mean, that's a good point, and I've already seen some posts up on the forum complaining about the time it took place. You know, um, I mean, it's difficult. But obviously, they're, they're still a relatively small Canadian studio. Can we cut them a little bit of slack for that? You know, or should we expect more in the future for, for EU players? You know, and not just EU players. There's a, there's a few Asian players on there as well. 
Well, well they just say they're going to do more of them. I think we've cut them more than enough slack with most things already, so I think just riding their ass about something that actually uh, uh, reminds them that we do care. <laughs> ever the cynic, Warlock. Ever the cynic. All the time. Yeah, be careful. They'll, they'll post your stats and show you how many games you've been playing and how you shouldn't complain because you must be enjoying this game anyhow. I do. I love the game. And that's the thing. Is if I if I did care about the game, I wasn't passionate about the game. I probably wouldn't be so cynical because I just go, oh yeah, turn it off and forget it. But the fact that I don't, and the fact that I care enough to to complain about it and to ride them about it, should tell them that I'm one of the hardcore players who is here for the long haul, who is here, who is willing to spend money on their product. And yeah, I'm going to complain, but you know what? I'll also turn around and say, you've done a damn good job on certain things, but don't expect me to kiss your ass on the things where you haven't. I mean, I think that's one of the things, you know, on a game like this, the intellectual property like this, you're going to get passionate players. And I think PGI needs to, to expect that to extent. And you see it a lot on a, a lot of other uh, very popular games, such as the if you've ever, ever played the World of Warcraft, um, the WoW forums are just full of uh, quite a few venomous posts and things like that aimed at the devs. But it is because people genuinely care about the game. You know, it's, is that something really that... that PGI needs to pay attention to, you know, be aware that yes, there are passionate players, but you know, don't take it to heart when people are so impassioned. But, but the thing is, for me, in person, and I am talking about me with this one person, I always like to think that although I might be cynical and, and though about some issues I do complain, I don't do it in a negative way. I don't say, oh, I'm going to rage quit. I don't say that it's never going to be fixed or that there's it, the world's ending. I always do look for a positive outcome. I do look for the way that think, well, maybe if you tried this, and I tend to make suggestions when I make a post about something, because I want them to realize that we do think that they do, for the most part, a really, really good job on what they're doing. And we do all, for, and I think I spoke for most people, when, we, when I say we do want them to succeed in this, but I'm not afraid to point out that they cock up quite frequently. And when they do cock up, they need to be told that they're cocking up. And the biggest cock up they're making right now is the, is the team thing. They need to get that eight versus eight back in, and they need to do it rapidly because they are losing players. They are hemorrhaging players, out of, even out of the wolf spiders. We have got so many people who aren't dropping regularly now because they can't do eight-man drops. And that's something that PGI need to recognize and deal with right now not in a month's time not in six weeks time but right now now i mean the magician touched on something there as well which was was interesting is the the timing of the piranha hunt and obviously next next patch i think it is this tuesday's patch they're bringing in the the new camo skins and it's going to be paid for camo skins. Now, a couple of interesting things about the way they're doing this uh, pay for camo, uh, camo skin visual customization. Um, the most important thing really seems to be that you purchase your, your customization, certainly the, for the skin of the mech, and you keep it until you pay for a change. Now, you don't keep your old customization it's completely white, it's cleared away, and therefore every time you're changing your skin, you're having to pay out money. You can't keep your old designs, it's all paid for brand new each time. Guys, how are we feeling about that? You know, I mean, the, the costs aren't a great deal. I mean, looking at the, uh, the plan costs, they're somewhere in the region of 250 to 750 MC. It's not expensive. But at the same time, shouldn't you be able to keep what you pay for? Yeah. yeah. That's that's the issue that I have with this. You're looking at basically $7 a mech. And depending on how many mechs you have, that definitely adds up to a lot of money. I just think they're going about it wrong. And it was like we were discussing earlier that there's the, – the whole thing with these camo skins is – 
the way that I feel that it should be set up, and I think a lot of people would probably agree with me on this, is that you buy a certain camo pattern. That pattern you can apply to whichever mech you want or all your mechs if you want. Where your money costs come in that would start to add up has been when you want to modify that particular camo pattern to add in colors that doesn't come with that pattern standard. So now you're paying for a premium, quote unquote, premium skin. And that would be a, by a per mech basis where you would just buy, say, whatever colors you want and apply it to that particular camo. But that camo design, once you buy it, should be yours to keep and apply to whichever mechs you want or new mechs coming into the game and be able to apply that to it without any additional cost. And that's not how they have it signed up right now. You're having to pay to put that exact same pattern on every single mech you own. And then if you want to change colors, you're having to pay again. And then if for some reason you want to remove it like you were talking about and then put it back on later, you have to buy it all over again and reapply those those colors and it's just continually asking you to pay more and more and more money now I can understand you know from a profit point of view where they're coming from with this but let's make it a little bit more reasonable and, and have players have more buy-in on it at least allow us to buy the pattern and then start charging us additional money for changing colors to that pattern I, I think they would find out that that system would work better and they would find out that they'd probably make more money doing it but the other issue that's coming into play is if you notice it's only available for certain mechs. Um, the reason this is coming into play is if you look at those mechs and depending on the type of camo pattern, whoever the artist is is having to go in there and hand paint each and every mech and each and every mech's additional items that go on there that change the appearance of that mech as far as weapon loadouts concerned. You have to go in and paint those ones too. So just to do one mech with one particular pattern is causing them to to actually do a lot on their side of the house to get it done. They should be looking at is introducing camo patterns that can be applied to any mech and they're just easily done on there whether you just apply it as an overlay which is what I used to do when I was working on development with MechWarrior 4 Mercs for, um, for mech tech is what we did is we would just make a base camo pattern that would be applied to any mech Anyhow, you didn't have to go in there and custom paint every single mech because it was just simply an overlay that went over that particular skin of the mech. If they did this, they could actually release packs where you could change your camouflage and not have to worry about going in there and customizing it. Then they could charge your extra or your premium amount for what they're doing right now. It's like they're releasing premium skins when they should have non-premium skins that you should be able to buy with C-bills instead of MCs. So it... it ends up keeping your players interested and being able to let them customize to a point and encouraging them to buy the premium skins. That That's where they should be heading with this. It, it doesn't look like that's where they're going right now, and there's probably going to be a lot of upset people the first time that somebody decides to pull something off their mech and then all of a sudden decides that they want to put it back on and go, what, i got to pay all this money again? They're going to have upset people. Magician, I mean, is it a is it a cynical cash grab, or do you think that the the effort they they're putting in by hand painting everything justifies the cost? Uh, I think you should be able to keep it. I think if you play League of Legends, you can get different outfits for your characters, and you don't have to pay every time you want to change what that character looks like. You know, so in this case, you should be able to keep a mech and have it saved up for different camo. This will be nice when it comes to private lobbies. So you can choose maybe a camel that adds extra camouflage for, say, if you know you're going to go on an urban map or you know you're going to go on a desert map. And if you have to change each time, I mean, it's just, it's just completely unreasonable for most people's budgets. Uh, I'm not going to spend 3 4 $5 on camo, on a single camo pattern. I might spend that if I get maybe five camo patterns or several camo patterns. It, it's just, but I'm, I change it each and every time. I... I just don't know how many people want to be spending their money on that in this game. How important that is to people to be doing when you can, when you want to be able to see your own mech in game, you know? I mean, Warlock, everyone knows skins equal skill. What's your feelings? <laughs> <laughs> well, basically, the way I look at it is we've kind of said that between five and seven dollars um, for each skin. Um, now, basically, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but I've got 20 mechs in my mech bay right now, and I consider that to be a reasonable amount, not hugely, 
um, overpopulated, but not hugely underpopulated either. So basically, at seven and a half bucks, let's take the, the upper end of it, um, a skin. So for those, you're looking at $150 to, to do those um, 20 mechs. Now, most players are going to want to have, who are part of an organized team, are going to want to use the actual uh, camo that their team use. So for, for doing that, I think it is extortionately expensive. I think that having it at maybe sort of three or four dollars a skin and being able to keep that skin once you've paid for it would, would have been quite reasonable and people would have been willing to pay that. But the issue is going to be is are, are puggers um, going to come in and are they going to spend money on that kind of thing? And the easy answer, I think, is only if they stay in the game. If they come in, play once um, or play twice and don't feel involved in the game, they're not going to spend the money. So I think PGI need to evaluate this whole thing about uh, use once and lose it if you apply another paint scheme. Um, I just think that you have to be sensible about it. Yes, I realize PGI need to make money, but there are better ways of doing it because are you going to buy one paint scheme or are you going to buy five paint schemes? Now, if you price it up in a point where the one paint scheme costs, say, seven and a half dollars, but you do uh, paint schemes that cost, say, a buck and a half a piece, what tends to happen, people go, is, well, it's only a buck and a half, I'll spend it. Where it's five bucks or six bucks or seven bucks, people might quite happily do two or three makes, but suddenly they're going to think, well, I've spent 20 bucks now, and they'll think, no, oh, I'm not going to spend any more on it for now. Whereas if it's a buck a piece, they're, they're quite likely to carry on spending it and, and not really even think about how much they've spent. So I think it, it would be in Piranha's best interest to make the skins as cheaply available as possibly, as possible and, and hope to sell in bulk. I mean, the magician mentioned uh, League of Legends, and I mean, let's face it, in terms of free to play it is the premium game it's the game with the largest following that probably makes the most money they massive right has a massive turnover and i think a lot of that is down to the cheapness of a lot of its perks a lot of the skins i've got a couple of examples here you're looking from uh, just a, a bog standard skin on one of the League of Legends champion is about 520 riot points. Now remember, you buy that skin, and that's yours forever, and you can choose to use it or not use it as much as possible. That is less than five dollars because it costs about five dollars for 650 riot points. So the lowest standard skin, less than five dollars, and that's yours forever. And there's a lot of skins out there, a lot of people can make those purchases quite easily. And in fact, you know, it's quite easy to buy those skins. It's, as Warlock said, you know, because it's cheap, it's it's easy to do, it's almost self-encouraging, you know. And they do go all the way up to about 1,820 riot points for uh, the, the premium skins they call it they've got custom animations custom voices things like that and that is about 12 13 dollars roundabout for that and again that's yours for life that is yours now by comparison you know as cutter was saying you're looking between five and seven dollars for a camo skin which you don't get to keep and i think more importantly with the the league of legend skins I'm fairly certain you can buy them with points that you earn through the game. You don't have to buy the Riot points as well. I may have to check that, but I'm fairly certain, certainly the, the non-premium, non-legendary skins, you can buy them with, with the points that you earn through the game. You know, is PGI potentially pricing themselves out of the market here? You know, there's already complaints about the cost of MC and the amount of cost you need for, for high-end uh, mechs. When you compare it against something like League of Legends, or indeed Tribes, or even World of Tanks, are PGI pricing themselves out of the market? What do you reckon, Cut It? It looks like they are pending that direction. I mean, it, it seems absolutely crazy to me that if I have 
three of the same mix in my mech bay. They're all the same chassis that if I buy camouflage for one of them, I should be able to apply it to all three of them. I shouldn't have to buy individual skins for each one of those unless I feel I really want to have individual skills for each one of those three. But I should be able to switch between any one of those three models and apply one skin that I bought for that model. I just I just don't understand why we can't do that or why they're not looking towards that ability to do that. It just it will make them much more money to make things easier when people know, hey, if I buy this, I get to keep it, and I can swap it between my models and not have to worry about buying additional skins for each one of my models that I have. Um, it just, it's not making sense. It sounds like they are trying to price themselves out of the market. There's a lot easier ways to do this without, you know, trying to kill yourself like they're trying. What do you reckon, Warlock? Are, are we heading the wrong way? We, we've already discussed a little bit about the, the cost of MC. Is this just... I, I, no, I, just... I just think that right now that we need to... I'm going to say something positive about PGI for a change. I, I think we just need to give them a chance and to see what their pricing actually ends up being because we've only seen um, a, a couple of posts about it and they're suggested prices at the moment. They're suggested uh, directions they're heading in. Um, let's give them a chance. Let's, let's see how they actually implement this and let's see if they've actually thought about this in a logical manner and actually implement it in a logical manner where people will spend um, the money on the game. And I'm quite hopeful that they will do something that's actually um, reasonable and going to cater to the majority of players. Um, if they don't, I'll be one of the first ones up there um, complaining and, and calling them to task over it. But they, we know that this money, this game is costing an awful lot of money to produce. Let's try and, and give them a little bit of a leeway and, and just hope that they've actually thought about this and thought it all the way through and uh, are actually going to do something the correct way for a change. I mean, the magician, 25,000 MC, nearly $100. Is that a fair price, considering that on release, hopefully, we should be looking at a AAA standard free-to-play game. I yeah, it seems about right. Uh, I, I'm most, you know, the problem is like I know a lot of people who are founders. We haven't really found a use for the MC yet, other than mech base, because why buy mech chassis when if your team's winning a lot, you can grind out you know with your premium mechs six plus around six million an hour, I think it was, and there's no real need to be spending a lot of MC at this point. So it's hard for me to judge exactly how far that MC is going to go for things that I, I want. You know, am I going to continue using premium mode once my free trial is up? Well, probably, but by then I'm going to have most of their mechs in my mech base. I'm not going to necessarily need to be making all those C bills. So I'm going to need some other reason to be premium mode to continue it. As for how much these trinkets cost, uh, I just don't know. I, you know. I played World of Tanks. I put a little bit of money into that to keep for just for premium mode, just so I could actually grind at a reasonable rate. So, and you don't really have to do that for this game as much. Uh, so it's hard. It's just hard right now to really judge how far a hundred dollars is going to go in this game. Hero Max. Hero Max. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know I confident on that four, but. I would like, I mean, I, I'm fine with seeing more special mechs with special skins and, and what, you know, however they want to do it, that's fine, as long as they're not um, better than all the other mechs, you know. I mean, I've got to be honest to say, I actually love my Wang. <laughs> <laughs> I love your Wang too. Yeah, yeah John, John keeps saying that, that, but I, I, I ignore him as much as possible. But yeah, seriously, the Hero Mech is, I think, is a good money making way for them to go. I, I think they need to think about it more. I mean, there's such a wide choice of possible hero mechs that people would actually spend MCs on. I mean, I'm a huge Kelhans fan. I'm a huge Wolf in Exile fan. I, I would probably pay over the odds to be able to have Grinner. I would probably pay over the odds to have um, the Bounty Hunters Marauder. Okay, we don't have a Marauder in game yet. We don't have a Wolf Hunter game yet. But they're both mechs that 
if you did them as a hero mech, you could then implement them into the game in other ways. There are just so many different choices. And I mean, who else here would, would turn down the chance to actually have Grinner in the mech base? <laughs> well, they've talked about uh, being able to make custom mech base and then with your uh, Merc unit points, you'll be able to have custom maybe Merc headquarters type things and things like that will be fun. And I'm sure we'll be able to spend MC to decorate them even more. You know, nothing like playing house. Um, I just don't, I don't know what I would exactly spend money on as like a faction fan. You know, a little statue of, of uh, Lincoln Osis, maybe. That'd be kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, well, that's I'm... something just think about. It. You could have your own little steel Jaguars running around the mech bays or something like that. <laughs> cats, yeah, that's what I just want, some cats running around the mech bay. <laughs> I mean, but that's an interesting thing. You know, you bring it up, but people do like playing house to a certain extent, you know, and guild headquarters, things like that. I mean, for my money, I would like to see the likes of uh, custom decals on Mech, you know, so that you can have your Merc unit's logo up, you know, on the shin of your Mech or on the arm of your Mech. I think that would be a good way to go. I just yeah, want a sign, sign that says Warlock's Wang. <laughs> yeah, they, that's the one thing they were talking about, too, is bringing about um, the decals, which I'm sure are going to be at a cost, too, and what they should be to, to add to your mechs. So you have your factions represented in, and, and whatnot. Um, the one thing that I would like to see, since they are now pushing into this realm, is to do something similar as to what they do in World of Tanks as far as when you're in your mech bay, you should be able to go in there in 360 degree orbit around your mech like you can in World of Tanks in your tank and actually look at your custom skin and look at your decal placements and, and whatnot so you can see what it looks like in game since you know we're forced first person, there's no real other opportunity to do it. That's the the only one way I would ever want them to do a third person view in this game would be in the mech bay like that so people can enjoy their little trinkets and stuff that they've added to their mechs sorry i'm joined by a small child who has got out of bed and is now sticking his tongue out at the camera because he thinks that's hilarious <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's i mean crazy to me though how much people actually spend on video games and in these things that are like temporary? I mean, you don't know how long the game's gonna last, and people will spend just incredible amounts of money for digital property and games like Entropia. And I, to me, it doesn't make no sense. I'm very cheap when it comes to my video games. Like I, I I'm probably not gonna spend too much of my own money uh, beyond what I need to actually play the game, because that's enough as it is. I mean, I spent now already sixty dollars on this game. I should have a AAA title that's worth playing for several years. You know, I shouldn't have to spend more money to play a game at that point. I I don't know actually. I am I'm one of those gamers that likes having items in his game. Uh, I was a big fan when I played World of Warcraft and the likes. I was a big fan of mini pets. I must have spent too much money on mini pets, which serve absolutely. And I'm now getting evils from the misses. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, they serve no real point in the game, you know, they're purely a vanity thing. But I would hunt out quests for them, I would pay money for them, you know, and, and it was purely a vanity thing. I think there's a, a real market for that kind of thing for a lot of players out there. And perhaps that is a route, as long as they keep it cheap enough, it's not exploitative, I think that's a, a very strong potential uh, revenue avenue for PGI to go down. There you go, another mini mech running around your feet as you race around the map. I have my mini Goliath on uh, World of Warcraft. My mini mech. Yeah, so, yeah, so do I actually, but we're not going to go down that route. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think that the, there are things that they can do to actually get money into the game. I mean, one of the things that I um, would have been quite happy with is if they'd actually made a subscription-based game. So basically, I played World of Warcraft for God knows how long. Um, and I used to spend the $10 or whatever it was a month on my subscription for that. So you know what? The way I look at it is, is that what would I rather spend $10 a month on? World of Warcraft 
or big stompy robots. Um, and I've got to be honest to say, big stompy robots win every time, as long as the game's there. I see you say that, and you, you're going down the route of, of subscription. But let's look at how many games are actually doing subscription at the minute, aside from World of Warcraft. I mean, Knights of the Old Republic, or, or sorry, the Old Republic, as it, it's actually called, has just gone free to play. Um, Lord of the Rings Online has gone free to play. It's been free to play. Yeah, for and some you know why that is? Because uh, I, I was in the closed beta for uh, the Old Republic, and the Old Republic closed beta, the actual game, although it was incomplete, was actually more playable than the release client. Um, and, and that's a sad indictment of the game. And if it had been actually a decent game and it had been as well supported as, the, as they said they were going to, I have absolutely no doubt that it would have actually been able to maintain the subscription. The problem was is they didn't um, fulfill the potential of the game. They didn't provide all the stuff they said they were going to. And when you don't provide the things that you say you're going to, people stop paying for the subscription. Um, and that's one of the things where I think if MechWarrior had gone down that route, they could have had a steady revenue stream. But it would have meant that they had to do the things that they say they're going to do when they say they're going to do them. Um, because at the moment they've proved that they can't, I can fully appreciate that's why they probably didn't want to go that particular route. I mean, I have to say, from my point of view, I'm a big believer that subscription-based models for, for online gaming is, is dead. And to be honest, I can't wait for it. Uh, I'm a big believer in free-to-play, pay what you want for the game. Uh, and I think MWO is, is going the right route. I think PGI picked free-to-play as a, a good solid model you know and I think provided they get their pricing structure right you know they make it cheap enough to entice lots of micro transactions I think this is going to be a very very profitable game for them and I think much more so than if they're trying to entice people to pay a monthly subscription I think there's a lot of gamers out there that don't want to pay subscriptions anymore a lot of gamers may only have one or two subscriptions going at once, you know, and is MWO really going to be one of those subscriptions? Yes, it so, is going to be for, for guys like us, you know, who are fans of the, the game and the, the genre and everything else, but for the, the mainstream of gaming, are they going to go for that subscription? I well, say no. The only thing I'm going to say is the premium account is, is effectively a, a monthly subscription. Yes, yeah it is, but again, it's optional. You don't have to have it to play the game. No, but what I think you do is, and I know a lot of people would hate me for saying this, but what you do is you have your premium subscription benefits where, um, I don't know, let's say that you pay your um, £10 a month and what you get is you get your premium subscription benefits, but you also get, say, 500 mega credits free every month as well. Or you give that you make there a benefit for actually having that subscription. You encourage people to actually do it, and if you make it worthwhile, people will do it. But you have to make it worthwhile. I mean, magician, what do you think? Are we is free to play the the model to go, or would we be better off at subscription? Oh, I think I think their subscription mode for premium mode is fine. I think that's that's enough. I. You know, what we're really paying for is content to come over time and them to actually pay the server costs. So unlike MechWary 4, where players were, were and the leagues were paying those server costs, we don't have to worry about that. So in that case, yeah, I understand paying a little bit more, uh, paying a little bit per month as, as part of the premium. I could see with the community warfare certain aspects of that only being open if you're a premium member. I don't know if they'll end up doing that, but I could see them going that route. Carter, what are you feeling on this? Yeah, um, I wouldn't think that they would want to shoot for a subscription type deal right now. Maybe a combination of it somewhere down the line, but you got to make it worthwhile for your player base in order to buy into it. And right now, the way the game's designed and the way it's played, 
it doesn't lend itself to a, a subscription type deal. You just there's no real avenue of where you're going or what you're doing right now. Um, this would have to be way after metagame, and then link your you know subscription to stuff like what the magician was talking about. Or even put it down to, well, if you pay for your subscription, maybe you can get those extra trinkets like camo skins and stuff for free instead of uh, having to pay each and every one all the well, time. Well, how about this as a suggestion then? You have premium time, and if you're a premium member, you get access to, dare I say, lobbies. Or you get access yeah. to certain features that aren't game-breaking, that don't actually give you any real advantage but just make the game far more easily playable. So you know what? People who are a part of organized teams are more likely to pay that subscription because they are going to want the lobbies. They are going to want the communication. They are going to want all the little niceties that make this game fun to play as part of a team. And if PGI go that route, I'd quite happily play it as long as they actually give me a reason to. And the key there is they need to give you the reason to. But then that's the... Part of the problem, though, of course, you you are prepared to pay for that. Of course, probably we all are prepared to pay for that because we we want those niceties, we want those things that are going to be easier to to run our match, you know, our match made games and everything else. But is that really going to be enticing enough for the casual players? Are we not going to end up creating a if PGI went down that route? Would we not end up creating a have and have not kind of team? We have that already. I mean, to be honest, let's be realistic, realistic about it. We're already in a situation where the community is split into two sides. You've got the puggers and you've got the team players. And there's already a certain amount of friction between the two. And let's just be realistic and, and recognize it's there and not try and hide it and not try and pretend that they're all the same community because they're not. I mean, puggers are never going to be, for the most part, team players. They want to do what they want to do and PGI need to figure out a way of allowing them to do that. But the teams are always going to be team-based. They're always going to be more interested in team play. And I, I just don't see, feel, see why PGI feel the need to pander to, to puggers who are going to come, play half a dozen games, and then leave. And let's be realistic. For most puggers, they're here until the next new big thing comes, at which point they're going to leave and go and play that. You may get a small minority who decide, who decide that they like the, the game enough to stay, who want to become part of an organized team. But let's not, let's not ignore the fact that that's the, the, the basic truth of it. The teams are always going to be the driving force behind what happens with the game. The game will die without us. Yeah, but I, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit. The people who spend the money aren't necessarily the hardcore gamers, like the really competitive people. The people who spend the money are more so the casual gamers who like to come in and play maybe an hour a night. And they're not going to sit there like we are and grind, you know, four or five hours night after night. So we have our mechs already and can swap in our XL engines and do all that, those things that cost. So they're going to be a lot more willing to be spending that MC to get those mechs that they want to play. They're, they're the people who are going to be more interested in the other content. And they need to make sure that they're catering to those people too because those, those people are going to be the bulk of the players. You know, okay. both, most players are casual players. And those are, so they need to make sure that the people who would come on and only play half dozen games actually want to play even more and so that they'll end up giving them their money. I'm, I'm just going to uh, use a couple of guys in the, in the Wolf Spiders as an example. Um, we've got a couple of newer members who um, aren't, don't have any previous experience of, of MechWarrior. They're not at former NBTers. They're not any former um, ladder league players. These are guys who are new to the game. Um, and basically, they've come in, they've downloaded the client, they've played a few games, and they've decided that, that the pugging really doesn't appeal to them. Um, but although pugging doesn't appeal to them, they don't want to spend money either. So what they do is they will play whatever games they want to play, but they are not going to spend money. And I think that that's going to be true of most people who are pug. I don't think they're going to spend the money that PGI expects them to, because at the moment the cost is too high. If, if they drop the cost down significantly on, on MCs, they drop the cost down significantly on mechs, 
they drop the cost down significantly on anything that costs real money, then potentially, if you drop it down low enough, they will spend money. But right now, um, I can't think of a single member of Wolf Spiders who um, have actually, who, who are playing as a new player, who have actually spent real money to, to shorten the grind down. Uh, we're, we're quite a big unit. We're getting close to 100 members. I, I have to say, I'm very much of the opinion that it's going to be the, the more hardcore players, the, the bigger team members that are going to be dropping the, the most money, particularly with the amount of money that uh, PGI is asking for uh, its MC and things like that. You know, for the 12,000, you know, only 12,000 MC, you're looking $50. Yeah, that's quite a lot of money to, to drop. That's pretty much the cost of a whole game, you know, a whole triple A title, the latest bloody Call of Bloody Duty, Ghost Fighter, Recon, Mega Mech, whatever version, you know, shite that uh, EA pushes out next. Uh, it, it's a lot to drop, you know, and it's going to be the competitive teams, it's going to be guys like us, really. They're going to be dropping that money much more than the casual. I think perhaps where with the casual players where it's going to drop in is the smaller things like the mech customization, you know, and that goes back to to what we were saying earlier about the cost for the mech uh, visual customization and things like that, um, because it's easier for for casuals to to pay out. They can customize the look of their mech, the inside of their cockpit. And again, I think that's perhaps, if they really want to make a, a good revenue stream, that's the way they should be going for, for my money. They should be looking at how they can use these microtransactions to really boost the income from the, the casual players. You know, how to visually customize your mech, how to customize the interior of your mech, all that sort of thing. That, to me, that's, that's where they're going to make a good amount of money. It's been done in the past with games, I think... It, it, a strong potential for PGI. So I, I agree with that. Because I'm going to say is, is when you look at um, the Atlas K variant, I think it is, I forget exactly now how many uh, Siebel's it is. But if you actually buy it with mega credits, it costs you about $20 for a single mech. And to me, that's just ridiculous. It's expensive. It's expensive. Right, guys, I think we're going to move on to our last subject uh, for this evening. And the magician, I believe this was a, a subject you wanted to bring up. It's the recent map changes that we've had, um, and it's certainly their effect on competitive play, or indeed play in general. Uh, talk us through. Well, I just think it's interesting that they're regularly changing maps and sometimes not even telling us what the changes are. We have to find them ourselves. Uh, the one I'm really interested in is Frozen Colony with that change onto the, the dropship over the hill. Uh, that's been an area where people of teams have fought pretty hard, and a lot of the matches end up being uh, determined there. Previously, you know, if, if you were on the upper DZ and you're coming that side, you could either go over the hill to the right, or you could go around the dropship to the left. Now you have an option of also going, sending a couple of acts through or shooting through, and it, re it reduces your cover when you're trying to hide behind the dropship. And I think it's going to make it a little bit more interesting, except right now I don't think it's quite working right, as I haven't seen the damage actually transfer through the dropship properly. It still seems to be getting blocked a bit more than it should. And what, do, what do other people think about that? Do you guys think that it's actually going to change up some of the tactics on the map? I have to say, we, uh, SJR EU, did a couple of drops the other night. I think it was our Thursday practice. And we had some really interesting firefights around the ship on Forest Colony. Um, that's We ended up doing a lot of drops on Forest Colony that evening. And I have to say, that's really changed up the dynamic of going the waterway. And it was nice to see that change. You know, you have the, the gap in the, the ship there, and we had a lot of snipe fights around there whilst we were trying to push up on the enemy base. And it made a nice change. Yeah, this is one of the things that I actually posted up on uh, the forums about was about maps and changes and whatnot. Um, one of the issues that I it just pointed out was what we were talking about is the ship in um, that particular map. 
the the ship is fine and it's really nice looking and stuff, but it's completely out of place in that map. It's one of those things where the water is ankle deep to your mech. What is this huge freighter doing in ankle deep water? And how did it get there and how did it break apart? It's one of those things that it totally destroys player immersion in this game. This river, uh, not river city, but this particular map looks more like it's a remote HPG site. Why don't we have buildings and vehicles and whatnot that actually support that map to make the flow of the map look better and actually make it more player immersion? You're not getting that on that map by adding a cargo ship that's pulling into a port that doesn't exist. There's no buildings or anything for it to have gone here for. So how the hell did it get here? Why is it here? It's just one of those things that's completely out of place. Pull the ship out and put some buildings in there that are actually supporting the satellite generators there or the receivers there and throw me in like a little dock with some little bitty boats and stuff like that that I would believe could be in that water. But this, this it's just not believable. It, it's one of those things that breaks the whole flow of the map. And, and I, I posted about this to PGI saying, why are you doing this when you could add in so much more realism to the map and, and, and get more player you know buy into an actual map of it being realistically seeing things that you should see there um river city they did a really good job on the only thing that they did bad on it is all the buildings look exactly the same why aren't there other colors why are there not billboards and signs and stuff that tell me what these buildings are why do why do they all look exactly the same it, it just it ruins the whole player immersion and just doesn't make it something that I want to look at when I'm running around. To me, all they are just stuff to block fire. It, 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 it just, just doesn't, doesn't help with that, that player immersion at all. Um, other games that I've played in, they've gone into great detail on buildings and stuff, and I don't expect them to get all carried away on, on detail and whatnot, but it would be at least nice that there's some other colors in there in that palette to make them something interesting to look at and help with that whole immersion stuff and I would hope that somewhere down the line that they're planning on adding in destructible terrain because it'd be nice to stomp down you know light poles and everything else that I could in a game 10 years ago where I could stomp my mech down the road and knock down signs I can't do that in this game how come I can't do that in this game I, I just it's one of those things that it just takes away from the that whole player immersion type thing that we need to have in there um, please, please, for God's sakes, PGI, bring back the physics engine. We so desperately need it. I mean, I have to say, I, I didn't even think about how that ship got there or what it was doing there. It, and it's a good point you bring it up. But uh, um, to be honest, I think it does add something to the map it does it's very existence there with the hole in the ship you can argue what it's doing in that ankle deep water and it's probably a very good question and something that, that PGI really needs to consider further down the line I think at this stage in open beta ha uh, however it's a pretty good change up to the map it's added some interesting dynamics to the map play, and I'd rather see that ship in than not have it there at this stage, because I gotta, think I think it gotta, really adds something to the tactical play there at the minute, yeah, which we you didn't have previously. That you could have did the exact same thing they did with that ship by adding in more islands in that exact <laughs> area that they already got in there that would flow and match the map. It, it would have been just that easy to build those little bitty islands there so that you could make that same little choke point there and have a, an avenue of somewhere where you could take cover and fire from would have been extremely easy to do they've already got those there and it's not very hard to model those map those little islands on that map and like i said the ship looks great it's beautiful but it's completely out of place <laughs> put something in there that i can believe is supposed to really be there let me buy into the fact that okay i believe that that ship could be there i don't believe that ship should be even on that map <laughs> I've, I've got to say, I really like the, the new changes to the maps. Um, the only one that I've got to say I did have a slight issue with was the Forest Colony Snow, where you've got the Snow Avalanche. 
Um, and what's ridiculous is this, the snow avalanche has this nice gentle slope that you should, by looking at it, be able to walk up. You can't. However, there's a steep rock face right next door to it that looks like you can't walk up it, and you just zoom right up it. And it's just little things like that that they, they should have paid attention to and changed. But to be honest, I'm just really happy that they've, they've thought enough about it to actually make the map, maps slightly more competitive because I, I really love the new version of, of Forest Colony with, with the ship on. I love the new um, snow version of the maps and they just need to get more of them out there. Well, What's it's up? Just really changed on River City, I think, how teams will play with the lower bridge because you can't shove atlases right underneath it anymore. Uh, so you have to either go up on the land or you have to, you know, to the right if you're going up towards the upper DZ. And a lot of teams I know were just charging up through the center before and that's being taken away. So those changes are really going to change up some of the tactics, I think. But I agree with you that, that your visual needs to be, it needs to be realistic on snow. I, I, I hate that because I keep going towards that snow and I'm like, easily can run up this. And even jumping on it, like you have to jump way over where you would expect to jump in order to get over that. But do you not think we're expecting a little bit much from PGI? You know, again, at least these changes show that they're examining the maps, they're examining the, the play spots, you know, they've released those heat maps of, of where most of the action takes place. And it, to me, it's a good sign that they, they are inspecting these maps, they're looking at how people are playing the maps, and they're reacting accordingly to add new things in, new dynamics, things that, that are going to change things up a little bit, you know. And to me, the, the fact that there are inconsistencies within the map at this stage, it doesn't really bother me. Does it, I have seen far worse on released games, you know, released I've, titles. I've, I've seen, seen the match on the back that point the actual uh, block points and show the deaths and the kills and all that kinds of stuff. And to be honest, I, I think, I look at that and I think, you know what? Why do you bother doing that? It would be far simpler to play the game half a dozen times and see what actually tends to happen. If you play the game, you learn that information and you actually get to see why those things are actually happening. Um, and I can't remember what the name of the feature was, but in, in NBT, in MechWarrior, um, and in uh, the ladder leagues, you had this feature where you could actually replay drops I think they would be far better implementing something like that rather than just the limited thing they're doing right now because I think it's of very limited uh, use in general. Yeah, that's just, the things they got going on with, with maps right now, and, and I, I really think they need to, to look at this a lot, is we've only got four different maps. There's only so many avenues of approach. Most of the maps have maybe two to three avenues of, of approach at best. You know where your enemies are coming from on any given map just by playing them a couple of times. It, it doesn't take a whole lot of imagination to figure that out. What they need to be doing is with those maps, besides making them a whole lot larger, and I mean a whole lot larger, because if we're eventually going to get to 12-man drops, we're going to need to have maps ten times the size of what we're seeing right now in order to actually make them playable. It's, it, unless you want to just go to straight on, you know, brawling where as soon as you leave the DZ, you're already engaged. Um, these maps, the way they are now, they don't really show a whole lot of imagination. They, they need to really start expanding that and looking at those avenues of approach and figuring out, which is probably what they did on that particular map as they looked and said, well, if there's no cover to get you up halfway through the water, which there isn't until they put the boat in there, the only real avenue approach you had was to go to the, the hillside and use the tunnel and approach that way because it was the only way you could approach under cover. The, the waterway we know to regular teams was suicide. You could just kill them as they crossed between those sets of islands, and, and that was why they had to do something there to break up and make it more of a, a viable avenue of approach. They, what they need to do is when they, they look at their maps is look at those avenues of approach and then figure out how could we tactically add something in here that's going to make that 
avenue of approach either more challenging or less challenging depending on what side you're fighting from. Plus, and I mean, this, this would be huge that they could do, and this would be an overnight fix that takes no time at all to change your code. Randomize some drop zones. Change day and night. You make now four maps into eight, into 12, just by changing drop zones and changing the weather on there. Day, night, storm, not storm, rain and hard, rain and none, you know, blizzard going on. Whatever you want to do, you could do that. And now, all of a sudden, your little limited four maps become an infinite number of other maps because you're making them alternate. And you could change that up all the time. There are several places you could conceivably put drop zones on each one of those maps. And, and still make every single map there viable and now give your player base lots of maps to play on when you actually only have four. So it's just those little things that they need to look at that they could do immediately. And I mean tonight they could change them. And we could have several maps to play with that you wouldn't even have to download. It would already be there. This would be just a little hotfix that goes out through the server, boom, and you now have several maps to drop on. It, it's... Those little things I just don't think they're looking at. Then they really need to sit down and look at that stuff uh, and go the easy route and do that and fix that so that now all of a sudden we have several maps to play on instead of the same ones over and over again that everybody knows what tactics to use and what mechs to use on those particular maps. A new magician is dynamic weather, uh, dynamic lighting, uh, an easy hotfix or is it not yeah. really going to change the maps well, a great deal? You know, I'm not sitting there with the engine in front of me, but from what I understand, CryEngine uh, 2 supports natively uh, time being matched up with realistic time zones and um, weather effects and all that. So it seems to me like that should be something pretty easy and quick for them to implement. The only reason I think that it isn't there is because they're really worried about how that would change the lighting and how that would work. But I think that's something that they should... They should have had a while ago. I mean, that, having fog, you know, if you imagine dropping on River City with uh, pea soup fog and no radar, like in MechWarrior 4, it completely would change how you'd have to play the game. And it, if you didn't know ahead of time, too, you have to really think about your configs then, too, because all of a sudden, you know, certain weapons, like, well, uh, people probably wouldn't take LRMs at all, but it would change just how you would approach that because you'd have to really seek them out and you'd have to get all close on them, tag them with your. Uh, their radar, to, uh, you know, pressing Q over them to to see them or R, whatever your button is, to pick them up, and you wouldn't just have them on your radar screen. S simple features like that would add a lot more uh, dynamics to the game, and I think I I know I personally would enjoy it a lot more if every time I dropped into Forest County, it wasn't going to be the same. You know, one time it might be a torrential downpour, the other time it's going to be clear as day. You know, things like that. That's gonna that's gonna keep people interested. That's gonna keep people playing. And it's new players are going to find it much more attractive. I mean, Warlock, where do you stand on this? Are you thinking dynamic weather's the way ahead? Yeah, all that kind of stuff should be in already, um, and I really don't understand why it isn't, because basically either if they've tried it already and for some reason um, it doesn't work in-game, then come out and tell us it doesn't work in-game and tell us that it's something that you, you're working to fix. If it does work, and if there is no um, real reason why we can't have it, just get it in there. Get it, in. it gives us more options. It makes us feel like we've got more than four maps. Because right now, one of the biggest things is, is, is it just feels so samey in sometimes. Um, and just having the occasional dark map or occasional fog map, or even turning like um, Caustic Valley into brilliant sunshine without the fog effect it would make it feel like a new map sometimes. So just the little random changes actually keep the game more interesting. I mean, but again, though, you know, we're talking, one of the things we said earlier was about the development time required for, for new things. Um, perhaps that we shouldn't worry so much about the level of content when we needed other things fixed, you know, basic problems we had with uh, with netcode right from the, the very first patch what does what does uh, PGI prioritize here you know is it those old bug fixes or is it getting that content in to make a bigger fuller game fix the bugs you gotta have a stable platform
whatever IG tell them to do. Yeah. <laughs> you that have... seems to be what the priority is, though. You have different developers. You have your content developers, and you have your engineers. Engineers are going to deal with the bugs for the most part, unless it's like a, you know, like River City used to have all those areas that you get tripped up on that content developers have to handle. However, right now, a lot of stuff is working right that's not engine related. And the content developers, like your map designers and stuff like that, that should be something they should be able to do. I mean, they should have the scripting available. If it's something engineers have to focus on, then yeah, take care of the premium it, pr primary issues that, that are causing people not even be able to play the game first and hot fix that. Don't wait a week or two weeks to patch it. And you know, then focus on these other, these other features. But you need those other features soon. I mean, you, you got people here. You're asking them next week to start being premium status. You know, if they're a founder, up to then we've had free status. If you want people to pay for this game, and they want people to go, be going and buying mechs, buying uh, cam camo patterns and stuff like that, the game has to be a little bit better than it's at right now, I think, to have enough people be spending their money. So if, if it takes you a week or two weeks to implement uh, fog settings and stuff, just do it. I mean, that, that should be something that should be a fairly high priority, I think. I mean, let's face it, at the moment, one of the biggest issues I see with the game is how many games do we all play? And I play a lot of games, and I know all you do as well, where we don't get, how many games, oh, let me rephrase the question, how many games do we get where we don't see at least one person disco through either crash or through a bug? And there aren't many. We, we get a lot, I mean, we most of the time have between 16 and 20 people on server normally. And, and if you go in and listen to the, into the groups, it's a regular, regular occurrence where somebody's crashing to desktop, somebody's getting the black screen bug, somebody's getting the yellow screen bug, somebody's minimaps disappearing, somebody... Um, there are just a million and one different bugs that stop the people from actually playing the game as it's intended. Their priority should be on getting the game to, to a point where it's stable, where a crash is a novelty, not the norm. I mean, I have to say, generally speaking, when we do team drops, we very, very rarely get anyone from our team discoing, but it seems to be a very common occurrence with a lot of the, the pug players for some reason. I have no idea why that is. I'd like to suggest that it's because they're sea built farming, but in the reality of it is, is I think a, f a fair amount of it actually genuinely is crashing to desktop because um, I suffer from it horribly. I, I seriously don't form groups anymore because my client, even after a clean install, is still so unstable that it's just not worth me trying to take group lead. I mean, I, I have to say, I, I say I don't disco and I don't disco. One of the bugs I have found, particularly with this last patch, is if I overheat, because I'm a, a shit mech pilot, I overheat regularly. <laughs> um, if, I, if I overheat, one of the big problems that, that I tend to find is that the HUD will disappear. As soon as I, I reboot, the systems come back online, I still have the overheat warning coming up and it is very frustrating and that has cost me matches that has seriously cost me matches because I'm in the middle of a fire fight or something like that or I'm lining up shots with, with gauze uh, and losing that HUD is a, an absolute killer especially when you're trying to play competitively yeah make the client stable okay guys well I think we've uh, pretty much come to the end of this week's topics so I just want to thank everyone for joining me this evening. I think we managed to discuss a great deal. Thank you very much, Cutter Wolf, for joining us very short notice uh, this week. I know JC what? gave you a heads up early on. Um, and once again, Magician, thank you very much for, for joining us this evening. Warlock, always a, a pleasure to have you back. And hopefully we'll all see you all next Sunday. Uh, hopefully at the normal time, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It depends if my adoring children will actually let me do podcasts. I'm staring at you, boy. <laughs> um, or not. Guys, thank you very much, and I'll see you on the battlefield next time. Take it easy, guys. Yep. Thanks, Thanks, boss. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.